This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll just wait for a few minutes more so that we have uh, the rest of the people who've registered logging in. Thank you. A very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we ha still have a lot of people joining in, but I guess since uh, we have limited time, we can start. So, um, IFKI in association with the ESX School of Management uh, welcomes you to this webinar on business model innovation in the era of digital transformation. And uh, we have with us uh, today uh, Karsten Yaku. He is Professor of Innovation and Strategy at and also the academic director of the MBA program in leadership and coding at EGS ASX School of Management. Prior to his academic career, he worked as an MA investment banker at advisory boutique firms like JP Morgan in London. 
He holds also a PhD and a master's degree and has graduated with distinction from ESCP Europe, Imperial College London and CAST Business School. So today, uh, as most of you are already aware, uh, uh, Professor Ghassan Yaqub is going to touch upon uh, various aspects on how companies can adapt, redefine and innovate their business models in the era of digital transformation. He's also going to touch upon important aspects like challenges and opportunities of innovation in this complex and volatile market. And of course, at the end of uh, his presentation, we will have some time for Q&A. In the meanwhile, we request you to keep your uh, uh, keep yourself muted. You may switch off your cameras and once the session is over, we can have a QA. and a Please feel free to post your questions in the chat box. Chat box. So without wasting much time, I would like to welcome Professor Ghassan Yaqub to take over from here. Thank you. Uh, Professor Ghassan Yaqub, you, are, uh, you need to unmute. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. I'll uh, just share my screen and then we can start. Sure. Then. Sure. Thank you. So hopefully you can all see the screen. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Sapna and, and the team for the introduction and for giving me the opportunity to uh, present uh, this talk today. I'm very happy to, to be giving this uh, talk about a very exciting subject to me and I think a lot of companies here and a lot of the audience about what's happening in general in innovation, the challenges of digital transformation and the opportunities as well that we're going to talk about today. And on top of that, I'm going to talk about the COVID crisis and not from a health perspective, but from an economic standpoint from firms. Uh, what do we know so far about what COVID crisis changed in the digital transformation and the consumer interaction and how actually we should or not be doing business in the future on top of the business model innovation that we're going to talk about. So uh, today talk, uh, we're going to talk about maybe three things. First, I'm going to talk about innovation in general. What do we know? Why it's so important and what's driving innovation these days? Second, we're going to talk about the COVID crisis and its implications so far on businesses this year with the latest uh, data and stats that have uh, summarized and, and gathered. And third, we're going to talk about the next level innovation. So what are we going to talk about in the next decade, the decades of the 2020s, like emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and all the opportunities, yet a lot of challenges remain. So we're going to talk about all of this, and I'm very happy to take your actually questions at the end. So let's get started. So uh, innovate or perish, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a catchy title, but it is the case, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about why. Now let's start. This is a bit of a, I like this to start with. Why? Because I think this is our human history human existence since my, minus 10,000 years plus today. And these are the major innovation that actually, you know, um, crossed our human path. And we can see from the first irrigation works minus 5,000 years, um, first agricultural revolution minus 10,000 years ago. Mathematics started mi minus 2,000 years ago before uh, Christ. And then we had some plague, huh? we can see some major events as well. But I think the key thing of this graph is that we live in exciting times. And I think the last 50 years, 200 years, we have innovated like we never innovated before in our human history. And I think all the innovations that actually have produced tremendous economic growth, output, population growth, and advancement have happened in the last 50 to 80 years. That's why we should be very, very grateful and excited about all these opportunities that we're living in exciting times, COVID you know, aside. And then I think there are a lot of challenges as well. And, and I think this is all thanks to innovation. I think this is where we're going in the next uh, 2020s and the, you know, the, the 21st century. Now, just a quick, quick, quick refresher. What do we mean by innovation? There's a lot of catchphrases, yes, we should innovate, yes, we should do this, innovation is the key. But I think we, we, we I, I, you know, when I do a lot of consulting work as well on top of my academic job, um, I'm quite surprised at, you know, how many companies think that innovation is, uh, can be just an invention, an idea. 
But I think in order for innovation to be really innovation, here I think there are very three simple words that needs to be known. Novel, useful, and commercially implemented. If, these, if one of your service or product does not really satisfy these three criteria, then it's not an innovation, just an invention, an idea, a mere project. But to really qualify for innovation it should be really novel, novel to the firm or novel to market, useful, and it's, you know, to have some added features or some useful actually uh, features in terms of service or product, or of course, commercially implemented, which is a very successful uh, implementation, okay? I think that's kind of the, the, the key thing, and just to set the debate right, what do we mean by innovation? There's a lot of buzzword around it and not everyone knows what it means. Now, let's give you a bit of a, of a survey of what people think about the business model innovation. Is innovation important? And this is a survey of a global executive that done this year. And uh, this was be, be before the, around the COVID area. 80% of managers, uh, aggregate level global managers, think that the current business model is at risk of being disrupted. And uh, to be honest, that's a big number. So only 20% of you guys think that your business model actually is secure, is kind of stable. 84% consider future success to be very dependent on innovation. And I think uh, this is a quite meaningful um, number. However, the paradox is, 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 is only actually, you know, 4% of companies um, have not defined uh, a strategic, you know, innovation strategic priority. And I think, why is that? Now, all of this is kind of, you know, general, uh, you know, outlining the general importance of innovation and to change and business, business model innovation. But I think what's, what, I think this is what managers like to think, impact on performance. So from aggregate research uh, and, and recent data, we know that innovative companies driven, uh, generate an average plus 11% in revenue, plus, uh, but I think most importantly on the bottom line, plus 22% on average more EBITDA. That's a lot. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you think about margins, and I think a lot of managers here between us today are thinking of margins, 22%, uh, so roughly, let's say, plus one quarter more margin. It's a lot uh, on top of uh, you know, other things that indirect benefits can achieve through innovation. So I think, just to set the debate straight, I think innovation has become a key driver in innovative products, innovative services to become really the main driver to do that. However, managers are very, um, are very actually aware of the real challenges that are facing the next years. Um, one of these challenges, that if you think about it, is this is not the good news. I think we should have the not just good news, but also you know the full picture. It's really hard to get those 22% EBITDA and 11% revenue actually up. Um, 11 out of 12 startups fail. That's very, as we know, more than 90% of startup fail. But for companies that, that already established, 19 out of 20 product innovations fail. The key question is, we put a lot of money in time, resources, people, for one out of 20 to work. Is it worth it? That's what actually managers, uh, some managers, uh, you know, ask me. Uh, when I actually meet and, and do some workshop and, and work with them. It's a fair question, right? There's a lot of efforts. And I, I think in the course of this presentation, we're going to talk a bit about AI, for instance, as the next, the next frontier in innovation. AI takes time to work. It's not you buy something you can outsource and you can do. It takes time, a lot of money, talent required, processes, technology, algorithm, data, structure, but the result is one out of 20. So yes, it is worth it. I mean, the, to be honest, the, the answer, yes, it is worth it. But I think it's not the question, is not, we should not be asking the question whether it's worth it. We should be asking the question is how to do it more efficiently and to ensure it's a very smooth transaction and a very smooth, very smooth transition 
of the company towards a more digital age. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today as well in more detail. Just wanted to, to, to share some key data first before our talk. So, you know, a bit to set the debate on, on, a, on the same page and the importance of innovation and actually as the, even not just the competitive advantage, it's actually to survive, okay? And talking of survival, I like this, this chart because I think this gives the average lifetime of S&P 500 companies since 100 years from, from today, 100 years ago till today. As you can see, the average lifetime of, of companies is decreasing. Now the average lifetime of a company, of big companies at least, is 15 years. It used to be roughly between 50 and 70 years. This is scary. Uh, it means other companies are disrupting the market. Other companies are emerging, but even other companies are not surviving these new disruptors. So the question is, if you're an incumbent company, what should I do? How can I sustain? How can I survive? And how can I really make it through the next decade or two? Because I think, and I'm going to talk a bit in, in a few slides, like what, what is happening currently? And what is the exciting part of the 2020s, the decade, uh, if we should be excited about? Of course, we forget the COVID for a bit. Uh, uh, we should have hope for the next 10 years. But I think there are a lot of opportunities, but a lot of challenges. And that graph tells you a bit about the challenges that firms are facing, an increase in market difficulty, very fast paced technological change, and a lot of disruptors with very new innovation to the market are disrupting incumbents and existing firms. So if we take all of this into consideration, I think we live in a very exciting world where innovation is key, but at the same time, innovation is a big challenge, and we're going to talk about it. Hence, really the importance of really innovating, changing your business model, disrupting, uh, modifying it, killing some aspect of it, don't be afraid to kill some aspect of it, having a radical change, gradual change. Uh, all of these words are nice, but I think not to be standstill or to remain still in this kind of very fast paced times is really very risky. And I think we saw that some of the stats uh, we talked about. So let's talk about, you know, what do we know about this, the, the business model innovation? We're going to talk about some cases that have been successful. And we're going to talk about why should you care about doing some business model innovation? I don't know if you've seen that, but this is an actual drawing by Jeff Bezos that he made himself. This is how Jeff Bezos imagined Amazon in the late 90s, 90s. That's it, that's Amazon. That's a real drawing, by the way. So uh, this is Amazon business model in a drawing. Where do you start reading at and where do you start or where do you end reading this? So where's the start, where's the end? I think that's kind of the question as well, right? Uh, you know, Amazon is a very interesting company. And I think one it's one of the biggest winner of the COVID crisis this year uh, on a global scale. And I think they have tremendous plans for the future. I'm not gonna talk about Amazon again, but I think that, that's not the main talk of the day, but they have tremendous um, plans for the future and not just about retail, it's much bigger than retail. Um, so Amazon has a very peculiar strategy because on one side, they have a low cost strategy. So having the lower cost possible, doesn't, which will have some low price in the future, of course, huh? which will have a better customer experience. But I think traffic is the main key of Amazon. The more traffic I have on a platform, the better actually I can provide more goods at a lower cost. And that's why when I mean traffic, it's not just about the product that are sold directly by Amazon, is what we call the third party sellers, uh, the B2B. So the, you can also buy from Amazon as a consumer through actually third party sellers. So these actually sellers are also clients of Amazon where they have commissions and they can learn from their data. So I think that's kind of, you know, Amazon. And Amazon is one of the fewest of the one of the few companies that invest or reinvest a lot of their income into growth. Growth, 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 growth. And I repeat it again, but it's all about growth, repeatedly. 
Uh, and this is what Amazon has been doing for the last 20 years. Grow, grow, grow. And of course, this year has been, you know, uh, have crossed the $1 trillion company as a market, which is a milestone, right? Like Apple or Microsoft. And this is what we're going to talk about the big tech as well. And the role of the big tech in the next revolution of the data. So this is to give you an idea about the business model. And if you are to draw this for your company, not necessarily, not necessarily now, but for the future company that you're imagining in the next five years, would the drawing be the same or not? It's food for thought for, for the managers. How do you imagine your company in five years time in a drawing? Uh, that's, that's a simple exercise. Good. Another way to look at business model, it's very simple triangle here. I think it's the term value is, is three times, but there are three types of values. I think three key questions you should be asking as well as the managers or in, in terms of products or services, how am I creating value for consumers, either B2B or B2C? How am I delivering this value? And can I deliver it more efficiently? And are there other ways to deliver it more innovatively? And of course, the third part and the important part is capturing the value. So the return on investment or the profits or the EBITDA or the margins. Is there a way I can increase that? Uh, by how and by how much? And how can I do it efficiently on a, on a five year or 10 year time? And this is the, the key things. And, and as you see, this is a, a, an interlinked triangle. So all these are actually connected together. Um, and I think it's a good, simple question. Sometimes simple frameworks are the best frameworks to deal with business, complicated businesses. So value delivery, value creation, and at the end, if you don't capture the value, even if you have a very value, if you create a lot of value to consumers and you don't deliver efficiently, you will not be able to capture efficiently. So I think this is kind of the, the triangle that it keeps on evolving as well, okay? Good. Um, why actually uh, having a lot of, why changing or innovating your business model? I think there are many, many uh, reasons and different companies have different reasons. One reason is you wanna benefit from new technology. You wanna benefit from blockchain. You wanna benefit from internet of things. You wanna benefit from crypto, crypto money. You wanna benefit from artificial intelligence. You wanna benefit from cloud computing. You want to benefit uh, from uh, connected objects, et cetera, et cetera. And I think if you want to benefit from one of those that are relevant for your business, then probably you should reinvent your business model quite early. Because if you're too late, then uh, you're too late at the party, as we say. Because uh, other players are working very actively on that. I'm going to show you some statistics in a moment that actually can be a bit scary. Next, you want to increase your revenues uh, by having a different, reinventing your business model. You want to just stabilize the business. Uh, I think that's, that's usually people underestimate the importance of stabilizing the business in the first place before moving to disrupting. Mm -hmm. So stabilization first and then disrupting or growing. Because um, a lot of businesses, to be honest, are declining. And the digital transformation, the digital era, uh, the business model are no longer um, suitable for a lot of consumers, how consumers buy, how consumers interact, um, how consumers see the future of your product or your service. So I think it's good maybe in the first instance to try to reinvent who you are uh, by having different value creation, capture and, and, and delivery and, and, and understand where can I be in five years? Can I stabilize the business first and not having a client? And I think that's, you can do it. You want to differentiate, differentiate by new product and new service, where you want to actually target existing market, but a new customer or, ex or a new market, new customer, or uh, a new customer with existing market. Okay, so you have different actually ways to do it. And of course, you want to reduce the risk as well. Huh? So uh, it's very important to do that. And I put some logos at the right hand side of the screen, like Dropbox, Walmart, Microsoft, Mars, and G. They have different strategies and their way of innovating and changing their business model is completely different from one to another. Microsoft, as we know, has engaged in a very nice, very successful so far strategic transformation uh, since the arrival of the new CEO like uh, eight years ago um, or even more. 
right? They've actually now decided to become more agile, less boring, more innovative, more cloud oriented, hmm? more subscri subscription oriented, as you can see. So the, Microsoft has been really changing a lot of of their of the strategy to become a really a very agile digital player. Which, in, when you think of Microsoft in the year 2005, 2010, it was kind of okay. It's Office, it's good. Windows is good, but it's kind of boring. Not much, it's not much innovation. Quite, you know, like kind of the old school company. Especially when you compare them to the newcomers, like uh, you know, the Uber, the Google, uh, you know, more agile and stuff like that. Okay. So I just wanted to give you some some idea, and I I, I recommend and I suggest you actually look at these and think like, okay. Which part of the business is the priority to change, benefit from your technology, or generate, stabilize it, differentiate it, reduce the risk, etc. Okay. Good. I hope everyone is still hearing me perfectly. Okay. This is what I call the term, I don't know if you've heard this term before. This is what I call the term value innovation. Uh, it's not a buzzword, I think it's a nice word. Very simple. If you need to reach that kind of sweet spot, two things. The value innovation is the stage of your product or your service where you create something, product or server, depending on your business, when you are able to decrease the cost as much as possible while increasing at the same time the total, total perceived consumer benefit. And this is the sweet spot for products that actually are by research and by, by practice the successful products or service. So I, I invite you to think about, do you have a value innovation? Where can I really drive my company and my products or services towards more value innovation? And I think this is in the form of a diamond because having a value innovation in your portfolio of products or services is a real diamond for business. Because a lot of companies are what we call stuck in the middle. This is the, like the syndrome of stuck in the middle. So, your value for money or value for position is good, but maybe not good enough in terms of price or high cost or the perceived benefit from consumers not that high compared to the price, but you cannot do much because your cost structure is high, uh, etc. Okay, so do you have different scenarios to think about those? But I think um, I think the key thing is to have this kind of small diamond, at least one product or service in your portfolio, or to achieve one in the next few years, the next month. Where you have this real value innovation, where you're really able to decrease the cost as much as possible and to really increase the total perceived benefit. Of course, Apple is a very good example. Very low cost and Foxconn outsource in China, and the total perceived benefit is very, very high and a very high margin. It's called a really perfect example of value innovation. Okay, and you have a lot of other companies like that. Good. So maybe let's now have a bit of a Example of what's happened. So as you can see here, these are all refineries supposed to be in the sea, but they're not. Uh, we see Amazon, we see Uber, Microsoft, Google, Facebook. All of these are what? What do they have in common? The key here, I think the word, uh, since uh, the interaction from the audience is a virtual talk, um, they're platforms. Okay, so I think the platforms is the new word, the new business model. And I think this is what really caused a lot of success in the big tech and the tech oriented firms to become a platform, platform for a marketplace, a platform for services, a software, data, advertising, all of these like Google, Microsoft, Uber, they're different businesses. Uh, Google is an advertising business, Microsoft is a software business, uh, even hardware with the surface, depends, but mostly software. Uber is a platform connecting driver and uh, and uh, but it's much more than that. We'll see what actually Uber, the big plans are actually for Uber, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So basically this is we're moving toward very big players, a few very big players that have a lot of power through the platform. And here basically instead of having oil is data. Data is the new oil. Uh, Sorry if some of you are working in the oil and gas sector. So of course, oil is still important, but now what's really actually the real gold in, in terms of replacing the oil is the data. 
data is the new oil and and the, and this new oil is manifested by the concept of the business model of the platform platform thinking this is what apple does they lock you in over time over time over time and it works every time hmm? yes you have the iphone of course you have all the apps they release new phones there is demand for new phones more traffic more traffic and a, and a larger ecosystem where you cannot where you have high switching cost of going to android or other systems so you need to stay it up and i think apple is a really nice example of how you can have a platform but a really whole ecosystem for you based on your app i think what really disrupted the smartphone like apple the first smartphone is not really the iphone if you think about it, when, when Steve Jobs released the first iPhone in 2007, it wasn't really the iPhone that disrupted the whole market, like the BlackBerry and the Nokia and all these markets. It's not really the iPhone. Of course, it helped to have a touchless screen, etc., but it's really actually the apps. It's really the application store, the application store that, that Apple created. And this is what Google got very, very, very right at the beginning with Android and uh, where Microsoft completely lost it. Microsoft should have been in this, not Google, because they're a software company, but they haven't seen it as a major platform for them to invest. So Microsoft realized it was really in big trouble in the late 2000s, and now Microsoft has really done a very strategic rev revival, which is a really nice company. Okay. This is an ecosystem where they're lucky in. Quick example on Netflix, what they're doing. So quick questions, Netflix has been 20 years ago. So, so this is not, an, uh, is not a recent company. 213 billion market cap with only 2 billion net income. So you're telling me, the market is telling me that the market cap of Netflix is 100 times its net income. Or something is overvalued or something doesn't make sense. This is a surreal valuation for tech companies. And I think I show you this because it's really in, in interesting what Netflix is doing. Revenue is 20 billion. Out of the 20 billion, they're putting every year on $15 billion in content creation. So it's a very costly business. Okay. So uh, I'm going to show you what Netflix did. Okay. So they started by rental, then by streaming in 2007, and then they they done them content production by house of cards and everything. But I think the key the key example here is how Netflix constantly reinvented itself without a market pressure. So at every time I call it chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. Uh, I hope you can see my mouse. Uh, and then every time Netflix reinvented itself. It sounds now easy in 2020 to think it actually it's an easy thing. It was not easy. Because in the Netflix one in 1990, late 90s, there's not much online. So they invested in postal office to have delivery by DVD rental. In 2007, they've done actually some streaming. But if you think about it in 2007, the internet was not really fast. I remember. The internet was not fast. We're still used in the dial-up connection where, you know, the funny sounds of, of the phone service. There is no fiber, no broadband, no high capacity for streaming. And indeed, they struggled for around four years in the streaming business. It, it started working around 2011. And of course, this big strategic business model transformation for Netflix when they started, when they took the decision of creating their own content and the bitch watching, so non-stop watching. And this is to give an example that Netflix has every single time of three different decades, the 90s, the 2000s, and 2010s, every time they preempted the, the, the market trend and they invested before time and beforehand. And that's why every time they were a step ahead of the game. Now there are big question about Netflix because the question is, what should be the Netflix chapter four? Why I'm asking this question? Look at these, and I, I, I know you have different uh, competitors in India, local one, I'm aware of them as well, and you have a big industry like Bollywood, which is a major challenge for, for Netflix. But this is more of an international level. 
So now it's heating up the, the streaming business. Amazon is developing that. It's, remember, it's their secondary business, Prime Video. Disney Plus is doing that, it's their secondary business. Apple TV Plus is doing that, it's not their prime business. And HBO is Game of Thrones, obviously the, the, they're doing that as well. And now Netflix, for the first time, a bit late in the process of the business model transformation is, okay, should I remain global? Should I have a global strategy? So a strategy for India, strategy for the US, strategy for Europe? Should I diversify? And to merge with Spotify, uh, merge with other uh, in the gaming, the sports, TV, have more physical presence, um, education content, uh, other content, forum, a lot of ideas, but not a lot of resources because they have only two billion in net income and an overvaluation. So the key question is, is $200 billion for Netflix overvalued or not? Compare, you know, when you when you see the potential of streaming in the future. Would you invest in Netflix? I think that's kind of the key. And currently Netflix, they're working towards actually the strategy. It's a very, very hard one if you're a manager in these days in Netflix and, and see when you have billion of dollars, unlimited potential. I mean, when you have Apple and Amazon with, with a lot of cash, yeah? more than governments, French and Indian government, they have cash more than even states and governments when you have to compete uh, with them. As well. So I think this is an example to tell you that even though you know, you successfully uh, did the three chapters, which are really ahead of the future. We are going to very rapid pace. That's really quite scary in the future as well. Okay, and and we have to move very fast. Good. Now, how is the COVID pandemic changing? Now, first, I hope everyone is is safe and and fine. Uh, I know India has been quite quite hit quite badly and is still going in the pandemic uh, and France is, is picking up very uh, drastically these days as well. So first, I hope everyone is, is fine and let's all be safe for the next winter and, and, and the summer and hopefully by next year we'll have better hope. Uh, you know, the health side now, I'm going to talk a bit more about the economic effect of the pandemic. I'm going to share with you the latest, uh, you know, I've synthesized the latest uh, data points which might interest it for you as managers about how the pandemic uh how the COVID-19 pandemic is changing things in terms of digital and stuff like that but recent survey in July August 2020 look at this I find it quite alarming hmm? if you look at the share of digital product and services that firms have in the in the in the in the dark blue and then the light blue is the share of customer interaction that are online. And look at the COVID crisis. We, we jumped from 30% interaction, look, one third interaction digital, to more than 50% in a few months. Now, that, that's, that, that's a quiet transformation in business. And I've seen a lot of businesses over the years, and you can see over the last three years, 17, 18, 19, you know, it wasn't like that. And, uh, this pushes us to think about whether, you know, what our companies are doing. Are you part of this company, those in the audience today? Did you do something digital in the last few months of the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, or are you not part of this 50-55% of companies who adopted uh, digital products or shifted to more digital nature of the company? I think that's, the, that's a very, very key uh, point to ask ourselves about the digitalization of business. This is per area, per regions. Customer interaction. This is customer interaction. So, in a nutshell, you see in globally, customer interaction now is above fifty percent online. So, and this rapid evolution between December nine, two thousand nineteen, and July twenty twenty, it's equivalent to four years times of evolution. So, in a few months of COVID crisis. Uh, we had a consumer interaction moving digital equivalent to the next four years, just in four months or six months. That's massive. Uh, I don't know if you had this data before, but I think it's, it's quite important to know that. Uh, now, it remains a question because it's not the same. If customer interaction are online, are they going to buy online or offline? And how the COVID chain, uh, crisis will change that in the next year or two or three? I think that remains to be unknown. We have to see how the COVID crisis evolves over the next few months, and then we can reassess. But customer interaction is there, is online. Can you catch that? 
are you able to catch this customer interaction or not, or not, and you in your field of thought? I think that's kind of the key question here we should be asking ourselves. Now, here we see that companies that have, uh, you know, ex experiment and invested first in digital, uh, they had, on average, much more organic growth reported in the last three years. So if you invested early on, and if you invested more, and if you experiment more with technology, you are uh, uh, on average 72% more likely to have more than 25% uh, organic. That's kind of a powerful data that actually was synthesized over the last three years as well. And I think this is maybe not very COVID related, but is the, we have some COVID data in it, but not entirely, okay? So uh, invest, invest, invest in digital, experiment, 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 and then you'll be better off in the crisis. I think that's kind of the key message. You will better navigate the crisis. Now, one of the big winners of the crisis, of course, no surprise, is the big tech, hmm? tech companies. And I, I, we see that from Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Tesla. It's crazy what's happening at Tesla. Maybe it's overvalued, maybe not, but that's a different, different talk. Uh, Tencent, uh, even the, the, the Chinese uh, communication service, Facebook, of course, Alphabet, which is Google. A lot of the, the company like NVIDIA, Intel, and Shopify, and uh, PayPal, and all of these. Of course, Zoom. Uh, we're not on Zoom today, but we all know Zoom is the, one of the biggest winners. But probably one of the biggest, biggest winners may be Amazon and Microsoft this year. And probably Amazon for the long last growth potential that they can achieve. So the question is, is this big tech and the COVID crisis gonna make the big tech dominance remain, last, or this is just a temporary bubble that will be normalized in the next few years? Question to be asked, but since we're moving towards a more data nature in the future, uh, um, I think the tech is here to remain. How it's gonna remain, that's a different thing. Will they be restructured differently? That, that legal questions as well. Now, Let's look at e-commerce. You know L'Oréal, it's a French Indian <laughs> event today, so I thought about talking about L'Oréal, which you all know. Global, uh, global leader, uh, global French leader in cosmetic and fragrance, beauty. See L'Oréal now, they have like 20% of their sales is online e-commerce. It used to be uh, half divided by two, two years ago. Now, a lot of talk and L'Oréal, uh, is expecting future of retail huh, to be 50% e-commerce, 80% consumer interaction online. Do you agree or disagree with that? This is what a lot of industry players are forecasting. This is what L'Oréal thinks. Uh, this is what a lot of other industry, you know, gathered that sent aside from other players. They think that the future of retail is going to be 50% e-commerce and the other 50% in physical score, a physical store with more experience-based retail, huh? with more tech experience-based, and 80% consumer attraction online. And this, this is massive. So you're telling here that if you're not part of the 80% of consumer who interact online, then what do you do? What do you do? There are big questions to be concerned here, okay? And I think retail have been, with, uh, have been hit quite hard this year. Like I'm talking about fashion retail, uh, not necessarily L'Oréal has been doing quite well, uh, but thanks to online, not, not, not thanks to others, to e-commerce platforms. But when we think about Zara or fast fashion, uh, they have much more uh, issues, big issues this year. Okay, so that's food for thoughts. Luxury, how do you wanna attract those? This is in 2025, huh? 30% of interaction by, by China, so this is the luxury industry. 20%, or if you B2B in luxuries, 30% will be online. Generation Y would be, and, and Z would be 50%, 60% of your customer, and most of them will be Chinese. So if you ha don't have these three, I think you have some big issues to contemplate in the next five years or by 2025. So I think it's really important to read the signals here. I think with the COVID crisis, the consumer traction really, really went uh, much more than that. Good. Now that we talk about innovation, the, 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 you know, the COVID era and the digital, uh, what's happening, the impact of, of COVID 
on the digital information, we're going to talk now about really some emerging tech. And I think what to expect in this decade in terms of innovation or probably perish if you don't do that. And we're going to talk about AI and some emerging tech. Okay. Now, a few things. Did you know that um, we have now 85% of new data sources? of everything we generate are new data sources, so connected objects, connected machines, uh, cloud computing. 70% of companies do not exploit their data. 70%. 70%. That's massive. And 80% of the world's data is unstructured. So it means unstructured, meaning it's not structured for an AI or a machine learning to benefit from reading it. So imagine now the opportunity we have to restructure and to explore data and how to move things on a digital basis. It's a fact. The world is moving digital at a very, 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 very rapid pace. That this is the un unimaginable pace. Okay? For example, next question is, if you're in a car business or car-related and direct dark businesses, who is going to be the next dominant technology? We have electric, hybrid, hydrogen, solar, etc. Why Tesla is overvalued? Because Tesla is, it seems to be positioned to be the winner of the next electric car dominant technology. Unless another player proves to be really a very fair competition for Tesla, Tesla is, will it remain to be so overly valued maybe or not? Depends on you see, but I can talk about Tesla another time because I have a lot to say, but it's not the talk about Tesla today. Now, the new maestro, do we need humans or not? What can AI do? This is a very, 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 very big talk to AI, I think. And automation and robots and all of this makes a lot of fear in the population and a lot of uh, found and unfound uh, fears. Now, why we, we're talking about AI today? Uh, I've never talked about AI before, I think, and uh, 10 years ago. It really happened in, in 2010, 2017, and 2016. Uh, what we had a breakthrough, what we call the deep learning breakthrough. And then deep learning breakthrough is this is the evolution of AI. And in the in the in the in the mid 2017, I think uh, Google Deep Learning, subsidiary of Google, uh, they managed to win a game. Uh, it's a Chinese game, Go. Uh, and then it's a game where then you're going to tell me, yeah, it's just a game. No, it's not just a game. Um, and this is thanks to what we call deep neural network, deep learning. So deep learning is a new set of algorithms that was developed in the mid-2010s, so 2015, 2016, 17, that replicate the neural network of our human brain. So now the machine, we don't have to give the machine any instruction. We just give the machine a goal. And the machine achieve its goal by its own without any human intervention and learning on its own. And that's kind of the really big scary point about having a machine, just a goal and nothing else. And this is the real, real, real breakthrough of deep learning, the new form of algorithm. Because we think like a neural network, and this is the machine is replicating how we think, how our neural network actually corresponds. So I'm not going to go technical today because that's not, you know, I can do a separate <laughs> webinar about that. But I think we had a major breakthrough that was not supposed to happen, by the way, just to be very clear, uh, unless 2035 or 2040. We're 20 years ahead of expectation in AI. That's why there is the big panic about what to do with AI today. Okay. First, good news. Let's start with good news. <laughs> Shall we? AI contributed up to 16 trillion direct dollars, trillion, in the economy by 2030. Okay? It's a massive amount. GDP of France is 2.5. Now we're talking five times, six times, even more, seven times. India, same, GDP. So it's a massive, massive, massive economic growth, GDP growth, opportunity. In, 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 in trillion of dollars about this. At the same time, sorry, no. bad news or less good news, 50% of jobs can be automated. What do you do with people? 
what you do with reskilling jobs, with reskilling people. I think that's kind of the key, key, uh, key element here. And I think it's a big, it's a big discussion. Okay. Now, are you ready as a firm? Are you aware of what's happening? By enough to this year already, huh, or as we speak, 20% of operational bank staff back office will rely on AI. 2021, 70% will have some form of AI to assist, not replace, I mean assist, in pre-creativity. Two years time, 75% of IT operation can be replaced by automation. I know a lot of operation in India as a business, huh, as a lot of IT, India is known to be a very high, high pool of, of very qualified people in IT, engineering, math, computer science. This can be a real issue about what can be replaced by, I, by, by AI or not, if you can do 25 OPEX. So it's a very food for thought here to think about the future. Now, some key uh, numbers about for the audience, you can identify your uh, industry, your sector. Here are the industry that are invested, you know, on the x-axis where they adapt the most and the y-axis where is the less demand than other industries. As you can see, of course, you know, um, high-tech, financial services, automotive, transport logistics are among the industry that invest a lot in AI and where AI adoption is the highest. And you have other industry where education, construction, professional services, travel and tourism have less AI. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't invest. It doesn't mean if you do, you will not benefit. You can be a first mover advantage in this. Now, what can AI give you that the current system cannot give you? Please focus on the last two uh, boxes. I would really say about predictive ana analytics and prescriptive analytics. So currently, in the current system that you have in your current data, you can have diagnostic. Uh, why did it happen? What happened? That we know. But I think AI can predict and can more than predict what we see at foresight, can really have prescriptive analysis, they can tell you how can we make it happen. We know that we can predict that, but AI not just only tells you that we can predict what will happen, but it can help you to optimize, to have foresight, and tell you how we can make happen what we predict. I think that's the power of AI. And imagine the advantage that other firms will have on you if they have this in place. It's impossible to catch them. Data is power. The new oil is data. And I think this is the difficulty of firms of investing. Because in AI, you don't see the results straight away. It takes time to go on what we call the analytic value escalator. Think of your business. Can you move up? Can you better predict? Can you better assess what's happening? Etc. Okay. So please note any question by, by, by you know, please send the question to organizers and then we re reply to all questions in the QA, I think, if I understood well. Okay, so this should be moving, probably, you see it moving. This is what we call a heat map, okay, uh, of Uber. I don't know if you can see it moving on you, but if you can't see it, it's fine. This is a, it's a live map. You think of Uber as a, you know, just a connecting driver to, to consumer, to client. It's much more than that. I think this is a heat map of the future demand of in San Francisco. Future, I said future demand not current demand. When you saw, when you see this heat map, uh, you would think of, oh, that's the current demand, I'll allocate drivers more efficiently. This is a map of future demand of Uber drivers and eats in the uh, San Francisco Bay. And they do that for all global locations from Silicon Valley. And this is AI centered in Silicon Valley. And this is quite impressive what Uber is doing. Huh? They have much more bigger project than just the car business or taxi business. And for you as managers, before you engage in AI, I think I want you to understand something. And this are, just focus on these two light blue. What is your business need? Do you need AI? If you need AI, how can you have a minimum viable product that you can convince your manager or your team to invest in it, or do something interesting? If you answer that, then we move to organize the data, structure the data, evaluate the models, predict, etc. I'm not going to bother with all that first thing else. For this purpose of the talk today, ask yourself two questions at the end of the talk. What is my business need in terms of AI or emerging tech in general or digital transformation? And what can be my minimum viable product I can test and make it success to have a better testing for a wider adoption in the organization? 
two simple questions are just ask yourself at the end of the presentation or within your team uh, for the rest of the day or next week. Once you achieve that, then you can think about data and how to get about data and what to do about data and etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Look at Uber Eats. I think you have Uber Eats in India, if I'm not mistaken. So look at Uber Eats, what they do. They have three layers of prediction on your data. You think you just order your meal because we're hungry, I order a burger, I order a pizza, I order a, a mar biryani, and etc. So yes, you do that. But there are three layers of prediction. First layer they do with the user, restaurant, and the context. Second layer of pr prediction, they do it according to the marketplace, the gross booking, uh, reliability of the restaurant, if you're happy. And third, they keep prediction for every single customer. They do not share with you, obviously. Okay. So this, even businesses can, can look simple. It's becoming a very complicated business to go in a digital era. I think that's kind of the key takeaway as well. Okay. And in, in order to have a digital AI strategy, I invite you to think about all these. Do I have the right platform? What's my business need and objective? Do I have the right organization structure? Do I have the right process put in place? IT, operation, capabilities, uh, systems, management information systems. Do I have the right partners? Should I go on it alone? Should I outsource? Should I hire talent for that? How can I invest? How much money should I put in it comparing to the current business, current product? This is very important for HR because the HR of tomorrow is not going to be the HR of today. There's a lot of free skilling to do, different type of job, and a new different uh, set of talent. What kind of capabilities do I need in order to engage in digital strategy? And we've seen the, the, alar the alarming statistic that have been accidented, accidented by the, you know, aggravated by the COVID crisis as well. So I think giving all of this, what should I do? First, business need, objective, minimum viable product, and then see the processes, organization structure, partners, and how to grow up. So, I like this because this is give you a very simple graph for managers in the future. So I'll, I'll give you 10 seconds to look at it. I'll explain, obviously. This is a simulation done by a consortium of, of a researcher, including McKinsey and other, uh, uh, other um, companies. This gives you like a bit of three scenarios. If you engage in AI in the next five to seven years, fully absorb it, so reaping the benefit in, five, ten, in the five, ten years, so you're a front runner. If you're a follower in the AI, so you absorb AI by 2030. And if you're a laggard, if you do not engage in AI, by 2030. You do not absorb, you do not engage. And I've done some simulation back on many macro, micro, operational, company related. It's a very complex uh, simulation. And they've looked at if you're front runner in AI, you will have a plus 120% increase in cash flow over the next 10 years. If you're a follower, so meaning if you're not a front runner in AI, you will struggle. You will be fine for, a, for five years, four years, but you say, you know what, my business is fine, complacency, there is no need to alarm, but at the end, then the, it will hit you when others will actually benefit from AI. You see, here, the, 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 the light blue is increasing, at the same time, the, big, you know, the dark blue is actually decreasing. So if you follow an eye, you will struggle for 10 years with negative cash flow before making actually a gain after 10 years. And if you do not engage in AI, you do not absorb AI by 2030, you are in deep trouble. I'm not sure if you'll survive. This is a very simple graph. You can show uh, your managers or you can show people. I think that explains a lot. And I hope the message is kind of uh, clear in, in this one. Just for this message is quite cool. Good. Uh, example of, of, of banks. In banks, we used to think of assets, mass production, high switching costs. The bank of tomorrow will be a bank of data driven by AI, where everyone can have their own private banker driven by AI and some human assistant. That's it. Who can do that? The bank who invested early, the bank will have more data, more powerful data, smarter data, and better operation to do that. And I think probably it would be fewer banks, but more powerful banks. Look at the number of robots that are increasing. Now, I think I still have five minutes. I think I'm on time. 
Um, so robots are increasing, will increase at a very, very rapid pace. And I think, you know, in, in all speeds, not just in logistics. And uh, robots are, are quite impressed with what they can do. And this is an example. Uh, this has been spreading in Europe very rapid pace. Ocado is a British company. Uh, when I've been in London, you know, we lived in London, I, I used to order from Ocado. Now they, you can order online directly through them as a supermarket online, but now they're doing a B2B business. So they're installing automated warehouses for supermarkets. So if I order something on my phone, it takes this robot that you see on the screen, five minutes to do your grocery shopping. That's it. These are thousands of AI robots through machine learning and 4G connectivity, probably next 5G, uh, that processes thousands and millions of orders in the future in five minutes time on average for each order. So imagine the saving you can do, the efficiency, the efficiency you can gain by having uh, your grocery done from an operational perspective, your supermarket. Already the supermarket margin are kind of thin, right, if you, if you know that. So imagine the, the, the potential of this robotization. Of course, now there are question of what can we do with the job losses? What about the human who will actually do? That's right, it's a very important point. There will be job losses. And why there is no consensus of the amount of job that will be lost, uh, 50%, 30%, 20%, we don't know. Uh, and whether it be net negative or net positive of, of jobs lost, there will be new jobs creation, of course, different type of jobs. But I think there is a consensus that a higher proportion of low skilled jobs will disappear. And I think that's a fact, unfortunately. And, and this is a bigger question for society and governments uh, who are doing that, because now we have a lot of big players like the big tech, GAFAM, GAFA, and other big players investing in AI without any supervision uh, in robotization, automation, without any kind of framework, legal framework to have a, a sort of a, not a legislation per se, but a legal framework to to better manage this and from an ethical, social worker perspective as well. I think that's very important. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go about that. So I'm going to finish with this slide and I think I'm on time. Um, I think the future when you combine technology. If we combine just the three technologies of AI, IoT and blockchain, we're at more $30 trillion, just three technologies. Think of the potential. Think of who will get the cake, who will get the bark of the cake, who will reap, reap the benefits from that. Um, to, to give you an idea of what we mean here, if you think of the, the last decade, so 2010 to 2020, in the last 10 years, what we've done, we have built a very solid cloud and very solid infrastructure. Without that, today, we could not talk about AI, blockchain, quantum computing, uh, Internet of Things, connected objects, connected machines, and all of that. So I think the, 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 in the last decade, we did two achievements, mainly, when, when it comes to tech. First is the cloud infrastructure and cloud computing. Powerful, fast processors, very efficient cloud computing. And second, we build a more mobile world. Mobile, uh, like a smartphone, mobile reach has increased a lot. So two main achievements of, of the decade of the 2010 is the mobile and the cloud. Now, 2020, I think, will be a decade for the development of AI and the use cases of AI in a pragmatic and a tangible way. And second will be an acceleration of the digital transformation for everyone and most companies. And I think this is the key thing of to think, maybe not too early, but not too late, because if you're late, you see you're out of the game. Then think of how you see your company by 2025, how you see your company by 2030, and what is your strategy and business model to change that, to innovate, and uh, to reach that goal. And I think if there is a business need and, and think of your sector, who are doing what, who are my competitors, or they're doing something enough, can I sustain over the time, et cetera. I think there are many major, yet, yes, there are major challenges. And I, 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 I hear you and I, I fully understand the challenges that managers face during the, this coming decade, because it's very easy not to change. 
business is going, I'm fine. Why change? Why invest in, in long-term things? Because a lot of money, who to hire, people, talent, process, operation. And now there's not, not immediate return. So a lot of managers are complacent or they say, oh, there's no urgency. But then to be too late because others would have built that. And it's not something you can buy. That's what I'm trying to say in the, the digital world that we're actually going to. You cannot buy and get the result. You have to build to get something over time. And I think that's the tricky part of the digital transformation. It takes time to reap benefits. It takes time to, 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 to have results. I think that's kind of the key, the key uh, benefits if you're a front runner or not. I think I invite you to, to think about all these questions and all these kind of reflection today. I think that's, the, that's it from my side. I thank you very much. I know it's kind of, uh, we're, we're used now to online events. I know it's weird to speak for one hour without interruption, but uh, I hope you had, um, you had a good, um, you know, you benefited a bit from some data points or had questions. So now uh, I think with the team, um, Neha or, or Sepna, I think you can send uh, your question to the organizers, if I understood correctly, please. And then we're more happy to, to answer any question you might have uh, for the next, uh, I think, 20 minutes or so. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kassan. I think uh, we have time, like you said, for the question and answer session. So I think uh, I will ask my colleague Bhakti to moderate the session. I think we have a, a we have about a, a significant number of people, but if people are also comfortable to unmute themselves and ask their question, I think they can do that or use the chat box. It's fine with us. So Bhakti, over to you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Please feel free to to ask a, a verbal question as well, and not necessarily by chat, you know. So. Sure. Please feel free to unmute and ask the question. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, can you able to hear me? Yes, yes. Ah, okay. Uh, I'm Srinivas Samandan. I'm taking care of uh, overseas education recruitment uh, in India to the institutes in France and other part of the world. Uh, but I'm an expert in France education in India. So what kind of uh, steps or innovative activity I should look into from the overseas recruitment uh, students' point of view. What are the steps possible from my side of where I can uh, adapt or where I can innovate myself so that I can just stand in the uh, competitive world? Yes, can you just, the first part, I couldn't hear your, which sector, sorry? Uh, I'm into overseas education recruitment, students' recruitment. Okay. I recruit students to institute like, you know, in French business schools, you know, uh, okay. IECG, but I don't recruit for IECG because they don't work with uh, partners, but I recruit yeah. for other uh, uh, students, other, other business schools. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's it's a very good question because I think there is a lack of information about these topics. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and even from experts, there are few experts in this domain. Uh, and this reflects a bit the state of the industry in general. When you think about all these emerging technologies, innovative technologies, there are very few people who know about it. And even there are very few expert, uh, I mean, tech people who are actually working on it. And that's kind of the scary part because if who's going to decide what in the future and how to do that? And then to back to the education thing is I think the best way is to start reading some things, you know, if that makes sense. Huh? Some, some common, yeah. uh, some common, uh, some common, not necessarily very complicated books business friendly books or actually to have some uh, which can with students or education can be good with podcasts okay and 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 one more point is like i have created a strategy or created a process especially for my education vertical and which i am very unique in that uh, uh, strategy or the process not many people are following that process but how to streamline and how to make that as an uh, business model or uh, any, any any technology where I can uh, use it apart from uh, uh, the normal uh, process? Yeah, I think I always actually advise the companies and stuff to start by a small project, a beta test, yeah. a small test, where the user, whether it's a client, customer, you know, the, the end user sees a benefit. So ask yourself, what's the value add that I can mm -hmm. get if I change the process? 
what value creation can I actually get? If you think that the value creation is not over or is not, you know, is not higher than what you have actually, then maybe it's not the right thing. You see what I mean? The right fit to do that. Uh, okay. I think that's kind of the, the, I think the first question is what can I, what, what am I doing currently? Can I do it more efficiently? Okay. If not, mm. is there another way to do it differently through technology or a different way? And what's the value add? But I think in, in communication is key because you have to communicate what's the value add for the user in order to, to justify a different process because otherwise people will not engage. Okay, okay. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, yeah, it's it's clear. Like you know, I mean, uh, I'll just uh, take your points from your presentation, and then as you said, you know, I mean, uh, data is the oil. Like like has uh, important of uh, data. Like I'll just try to look into how uh, modify my strategy to recruit the right data to have the right data and to work on those data. Uh, thank you so much, Pro Professor, for thank the you. wonderful presentation. Thank you. Anybody would like to ask any more questions? The floor is open. Uh, you can please, please feel free to unmute yourselves or uh, put your questions in the chat box. So, any question, even related to your business, or any any question that you had about, you know, the the, the any points that are raised uh, that you agree or you're not very sure about or disagree or. You know, I think it's an open discussion. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the... Yes, Professor Nasser, we have one question. Uh, it's by Mr. Shiv Vachish. He's asking, can AI predict any disruptive technology? Does AI predict any disruptive technologies? That's it? Yes. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I can ask it in... Uh, in uh... Verbally also, I wanted to find out, for example, in the fight against electric vehicles and uh, hydrogen. Uh, for, for, for example, in the passenger car segment, electric vehicles are really far ahead and therefore te Tesla has got a huge uh, market cap. On the other hand, when you're looking at other fuel technologies for other uses, whether it's ships or aeroplanes or even uh, public transport or trucking, uh, you have hydrogen which is building up its own network. So at a certain point in time, hydrogen will possibly become as easily available as, <clears throat> or maybe even more available than, <clears throat> for example, electricity points. So is there any way of predicting what might cross over first on the basis of all the existing data that exists in the market on the two technologies? That's the question. Uh, you, you can, but it's tricky because you need a lot of data points. So I think uh, I'm going to make an analogy where it's simple. We drink water. The water for the AI is data, right? I think So I think if we don't give the AI a lot of historical data about what can work, what cannot work, the data will be less predictable in, in the sense of accurate prediction, right? And I think that's kind of the key issue with AI is... Uh, Usually they predict for the same pattern, but not for very different patterns so far. I don't know if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, yeah, uh, I understand. Yeah. So I would be a bit uh, not skeptical now. I think the algorithm and we're doing a lot of advances uh, in, 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 in how AI is evolving. But first, I think a, a key step that a lot of companies do not do is to structure perfectly the data in order for the AI to work on it properly. You see, uh, if this is not done in a very, very, very delicate manner, the AI can actually go on very on many biases, subjective interpretation, and actually wrong prediction. Right. Uh, that's, that's the first layer to really adjust. The second, yes, I would say they can predict, and I think um, it's being uh, used now for the COVID and in, in, in medicine. Uh, AI is being used to spot the best uh, molecule that can actually better treat uh, the COVID-19 and respiratory syndrome, right? So this is right. a prediction, not a fact, right? Uh, but why this prediction actually is, is actually uh, uh, can happen accurately because we know a lot of historical data on how existing drugs work. Right. And the, 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 
through the deep learning, which is different than machine learning, uh, the deep learning can is able to look at millions of data points that we human beings don't have time or we cannot actually do, technically speak. Uh, right. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to look at prediction. And you're right, and the question is very, very important. Yes, we can, but we have to look at what historical data we have, how we structure the AI algorithm, and whether it's, we have enough data to have prediction about something different with no existing data points. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Hi, uh, uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, I'll just go ahead. Mr. Sony Matthew has asked, uh, how do you think by 2030 AI will impact different professional advisory services? Can you give some examples? Yes, that's a very good point because uh, myself, uh, I've been working with JP Morgan and, uh, you know, in London uh, for many years. So this is a you know, kind of advisory firm as well, right? So it's an investing, it's investment banking is an advisory firm, um, consulting, legal, all of that. I think here we have to take it by sector. So I think for for consulting firm like strategy consulting, uh, like Accenture, like uh, Big Four, uh, all of that, I think there would be more demand for digital um, assistance in the future. Um, however, in accounting, for instance, the auditing part, AI can easily replicate a lot of auditing, uh, accounting things in the future. So probably accounting will be much more easily automate, automated than other sectors, while providing a very, you know, um, peculiar, tailored, customized recommendation advice, like a real consultant, that I think it was great. The nature of the demand will change. There'll be maybe more digital or more specific to business or different by sectors. So I cannot talk about all sectors now. And I think that's kind of the, the challenge. For the legal side, there's a lot of, you know, it's still a professional advisory and legal, the law, the corporate law at least. I'm talking about corporate law. Um, uh, corporate law is, is quite interesting because the AI can actually do it. We have whole the history of legal precedent that are available on record online or on file. We can put it, we can structure it in a system, in a cloud system. The AI can read very accurately on precedent legal uh, cases and they can predict what's going to happen with the really good arguments. So I think there's a lot of question about having an AI lawyer. But the question I can ask you as an audience, would you accept an AI law lawyer as a human being? even though the accuracy will be eventually high, right? So technology is one thing, but I think we have to go on the, whether humans accept some things or not. And um, so, yes, I think the, 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 the future of, of law will be a human plus AI for better performance, same as banking, no, same as banking. So that's kind of a bit my, my view on the professional advisory firms. Uh, that makes sense. I don't know if there is any follow up from the person who asked that question, uh, but I think that's kind of the, the, the need. I think all the jobs, and I think other sites, I, I could not show because of time, all the jobs where you have to develop a critical thinking, research ability, scientific judgment, uh, critical judgment, these are very unlikely to be replaced for a very long time, uh, at least for 30, 40, 40 years from now. All the other jobs, uh, there is a high risk. Uh, we have one, uh, one more question. Uh, Mr. Manish Padharia has asked, where do you see India in terms of this new challenge or new opportunities related to digitalization or AI? So it's, a very, it's a very interesting point. I've been, uh, should have been uh, teaching as well to a lot of Indian uh, uh, students uh, and executives. So some younger students and executives from India uh, last year and before the COVID, I had many, many Indian exchanges actually every year. So I'm quite familiar with the Indian audience as well, which I, I really like, uh, by the way. Uh, so um, India is, is, a, is a difficult case because of the, it's a big economy, but there's a lot of advancement needed on many, many, many fronts at the same time, right? Economic, economic growth 
is needed, but at the same time, there are a lot of challenges because there are different Indias within India, if, I, if that makes sense. I'm not Indian, so I'm not sure I can qualify to say that, but different sub-economies in India have understood well. And I think if you compare India to China, for instance, which is a very big economy, everything is so centralized. Uh, so in China, the AI strategy, the digital strategy, everything is so centralized. And it's scary what they're doing in China. It's scary not in the sense that it's scary, but China's long-term objective is to become the only leader in AI in the future. And they're doing it at a very fast pace. They have the best patents. They have the most registered patents in deep learning. They're working under the water on the very long-term AI strategy. Now, the key question in India is like, even though they're similar in GDP, but they're different economic prosperity. I think in India, there are first challenges when it comes to medicine, uh, to health, uh, to uh, poverty, to a lot of things. But I think this is where is the opportunity at the same time to use the digital uh, digitalization, uh, AI, actually to advance the things. You can do a lot of things uh, with actually a digital world to improve one's medicine. I think medicine and healthcare, you can improve a lot. And this is why everyone is so excited about AI because of the potential to achieve a lot of things in medicine. You predict a lot of things, you eliminate a lot of diseases that have already been there in the developing world, like in India and Africa. Uh, I think there's a massive, massive opportunity in using digital. So this is, this is a very big question. So I, I can answer for an hour and even more because I can talk by sector. So I don't know if this question was meant to a specific sector, but I think here, the potential for India, there is a huge potential. And I think India should be really leading the world because you guys have the talent, the best engineers, computer science, one of the best HR talent in, in the world. And, and, and you're actually exporting all of that to the US and, and the Silicon Valley, where I met a lot of Indian from Indian origins. So I think the key question, how you're, you retain the talent at home and you develop an ecosystem. I think what, need, what needs to be done in India is to develop an ecosystem. And to develop an ecosystem, you cannot just leave it by nature. You need some government or policy making, not maybe a, a direct government intervention, but some policy making that has some vision towards the next 10 years, 15 years, or where we want to be the India digital to be. What are the objectives? How can we do that? How can we have startups? How can we make uh, the mid-cap company or SMEs transform to more digital agile players? I think that's kind of the question. And of course, then you have to take it by sector. And if you look at the Financial Times and a lot of actually, you know, uh, articles, there are a lot of actually nice uh, use cases, successful cases about Indian companies uh, using AI and digitalization to improve their operations. Of course, but uh, I'm not talking about Tata and you know, consulting the big companies. I'm talking about SMEs as well. Uh, I don't know if I answered all your questions. It's a very vast question. Uh, but I think there's a massive opportunity in India. You guys should be at the forefront and not buy things from IBM, from Tencent, from Huawei. You should be pioneering, you should be one of the pioneers of that because you're selling your talent to, to outside uh, American and Chinese players. I don't know if that makes sense what I did, but uh, it's, it's a delicate topic as well. <laughs> Uh, one more question, Mr. Sunil Kumar Sini is asking, do you have the DBA course with any scholarship opportunity? Uh, Doctor of Business Administration. So it's not, I think, uh, you have a PhD, it's more academic. This, uh, Doctor of Business Administration is more like applied PhD, right? Um, so I'm not sure we have a DBA program, we have a PhD program, but uh, feel free to get in touch uh, with me. I can put you with the right contact or right people, or I can help you get some scholarship with that. A lot of universities in Europe usually offer scholarship if you want to do a PhD. You don't have to pay for it, and they offer you a stipend depending on um, merit scholarship or not. But there are a lot of opportunities a lot of people do not know. So please, I think Sunil, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so Sunil, uh, please feel free to contact me by email, and I can put you in touch with uh, I don't think we have a DBA program, we have a PhD program. I don't know if you're looking at the same or not, but feel free to contact me for any more questions. Uh, Professor Gusson, we don't have the DBA program. Mm -hmm. However, we have a joint PhD program with KU Leuven from Belgium. 
Yes, I know that. So I, maybe they have, or we can put them in context. So. Uh, we have one last question, sent to be by Mr. Vishal Singh. Uh, what all work goes on in structuring the unstructured data? And if you could give a quick comment on the AI as combination for the future, on people and AI as a combination for future. Okay. Uh, well, so about the second question, uh, which is uh, the AI combination in the future, right? So, okay. Um, well, I think the real potential of AI is when we will have a maturity and everyone will be more digital. Everyone will be using the cloud, much more prevalence. Digital adoption will be not at 50%, but maybe more than 80%. There will be more connected objects than ever, which is projected to happen in the next five years. Connected devices, connected homes, smart homes, smart machines, industry and consumer, both company and in consumer, person consumer. You add to that a blockchain for, to facilitate some processes and, and, and to some transactions. And you add to that quantum computing. We haven't, I think this is a big topic. With quantum computing, the next level of computing where the computer is not binary. So it's not zero or one. It's any state between zero and one. So what does it mean in practice? It means that the computer can compute um, in one second unlimited number of calculation, which is increasingly needed for AI. Because the AI go and through, through billions of data points, million of data points per second. If you have a much more quantum computing, so powerful co computing with unlimited potential, the AI can learn at a much rapid rate. So you will have faster results for AI and better results with time that will improve with time. So you will have, a, like think of quantum as catalyst for AI to facilitate the advancement of AI. And if you merge all of these together, you will have a very powerful AI. That can be scary because AI can learn on its own as well. So we're expecting that in by 2040, 2050, the AI will probably reach similar level as cognitive human intelligence, which is scary, guys. It's not in London in a very long time. Right? So, uh, so food for thoughts. That's my, my way. But for, for, for the imminent, short, and medium term, it's a great opportunity in, in combining technologies. Uh, and I think it will give you much faster results and more efficient results. Now, um, what was the first question? Sorry. Uh, the, the first question was, what all work is going on structuring the unstructured data? Yes, so that, that just should be like an in-house cleaning first, I think. First, I think you should get the proper management information system, so proper data infrastructure, servers, enterprise network, a proper efficient uh, organization of the data, and I think to get it structured, because if it's unstructured, the AI cannot do anything. And I think how to do that, that's a big question. Uh, one, you hire the talent to do it, some data analyst, engineer, or AI, or something, engineer or analyst to do that. Or it's second, sometimes uh, there are companies like IBM who can outsource or help companies. And I'm not talking about I don't have any stake in it, but like IBM, uh, to actually uh, help companies to structure data or to uh, organize data in a sort that actually can be used by a machine learning software. Um, and I, I think that's it. And I think if you put it just in Excel, I think it's not enough. Um, it's unstructured and it's a lot of files. I think it's the, the, this is a consulting on its own, but I think uh, this is the real work that needs to be um, discussed with more experts on, on the field, like data analysts, engineers, or computer scientists, like in a very, have a very efficient, what we call management information system without a very smooth, efficient management information system, you cannot have a uh, data. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, how do you see the challenge of information or data theft? And is the industry prepared to cover the future growth in technology and AI? Okay, so that's two different questions, but um, uh, I will probably answer the first one because I partially answered the second part of the question about the future. So the first one is about data theft and privacy and, uh, okay. So to be honest, there is a dark side of the force. Okay, I'm not really into Star Wars, but there's a dark side of AI and this thing. Huh? Um, 
how is it analyzed by whom how the algorithm is working how are we doing biases i think there is a lot of biases in the data why there are biases because the ai learns from our data and human data is biased because we have a lot of discrimination we have a lot of uh, different opinions we have a lot of uh, questionable uh, ideas uh, sometimes dangerous ideas so the ai learns from all of them so uh, uh, First, we have to look at how to make the AI less, more ethical, less prone to manipulation, less prone to human biases as we know it. Second, cybersecurity is one of the biggest challenges, I think, today. Okay. It's an underestimated challenge. So cybersecurity is very, very important. And I think there are a lot of instances where um, you, know, you, 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 you steal data and I think all companies should be ready to have a cybersecurity challenge in the future, because there will be. The challenge, because the future is about data, so those who control data control what you have and how you can do things as a company and as a business, as a government even, and even politics. So I think we have to protect the data at any cost. And I think the AI, uh, well, is prone to uh, theft and manipulation. Uh, so I think we have to put systems in place and then comes back to the earlier question is how to uh, uh, protect the data. And I think you have to put a very strong management information system in place. You have to protect the data, hire people who are, know what they're doing or outsource to very good players who actually know the data safety. But yes, of course, uh, there is data protection. What data do you need to release? What data of your customer or consumers can you actually use? Is it ethical? Is it not ethical? Um, there's a big questions here. And I think the, the, the concern, there is no global framework in managing this emerging technologies like in digital data and uh, you know, AI and blockchain and internet of things. Like if you have an Amazon Alexa in your home, who can control that? Now you, ha you can take some boxes, but if you don't take, they can listen to you because if, you, if they listen to you, the AI will improve over time much faster. See? Benefit and cost. So I think the key assumption, I'm going to finish with that. The assumption is, and I think that was that the big tech is working on, as long as, as a big tech or tech provider, I provide you with a value add that in, that's improving over time and over time, and it's more convenient for you, you will let us use your data because the value add is higher. And that's what they keep on pushing constantly. As long as the convenience outweighs the risk, it's fine. But it's a big issue, cybersecurity. Big, big, big issue. Uh, and, and, and I think there are even government involved in stealing data. I mean, it's not, it's a massive, uh, it's a massive industry, cybersecurity. I, I think it will be a booming industry in the future. What? I think I don't know. I think that was it. Or the other questions? Uh, yes, dear, this was the last question. Thank you so much, Professor. I will now request my colleague, Ms. Neha Nathani, to do the vote of thanks. Thank you, Bhakti. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Kassim for such an informative session. We, uh, we learned how innovation have helped companies to grow the COVID impact on digital transformation and the role of AI and emerging technologies in digital transformation. I would also like to thank all the participants for taking out time to attend the session. I hope the session was useful for everyone. For more such information and more uh, uh, workshops and training, please feel free to contact us on employment.service at ifcci.org.in. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice week ahead. Thank you very much as well for the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you.